I wonder if you've ever seen this picture before. It's March 7th, 1965. We're in Selma, Alabama. A peaceful march is about to take place. A march from Selma to Montgomery. It was organized by non-violent activists demanding African-American citizens be allowed to exercise their constitutional right to vote. Because at that time, they had no vote. But what started as a peaceful protest quickly turned violent. State troopers brutally attacked the marchers. Tear gas, batons, people beaten unconscious. One of the march's leaders, Amelia Boynton, was left lying unconscious on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a photograph that was broadcast around the world. This was a powerful example of a minority standing against the majority, a small group of people pushing back against injustice. And then we shift from 1965 to January the 20th, 2009. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. From African Americans not even having the ability to vote, to Barack Obama as President of the United States of America. In this video, we're not talking about politics. We're talking about psychology. We're going to explore how a minority can influence the majority. Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're finishing our series on social influence by exploring minority influence. Minority influence is when a person or small group persuades others, often the majority, to adopt their beliefs, attitudes, or behaviours. Let's explore this using a more recent example of Colin Kaepernick and the Black Lives Matter movement. Colin Kaepernick was the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers in the NFL, having taken his team to the Super Bowl in 2013. Colin Kaepernick! What a game! Touchdown! During August 2016, he started to protest against racial injustice and the police brutality towards black people. Kaepernick worked with a former member of the US Army Special Forces, Nate Boyer, to find an effective way to voice the protest. They came up with the idea that rather than stand for the national anthem, he would take a knee instead. When Kaepernick took a knee at the game, a journalist reported on the event and it soon made national news. Kaepernick had turned the spotlight of the nation onto the issue of systemic racism and police brutality and done so using peaceful means. We have cops that are murdering people. We have cops in the SFPD that are blatantly racist and those issues need to be addressed. As one journalist wrote, taking a stand by bending a knee. But what we see here is an example of how minority influence works. Psychologists have outlined three key factors that make minority influence more effective. Number one, consistency. Consistency means that the minority holds the same position over time, known as diachronic consistency, and that all members share the same view known as synchronic consistency. This draws attention and creates doubt in the minds of the majority. Kaepernick knelt during every anthem, week after week. He didn't change his message and calmly explained his reasons in interviews. When there's significant change and I feel like that flag represents what it's supposed to represent and this country is representing people the way that it's supposed to, I'll stand. This kind of consistent behaviour challenges the majority to reconsider their views. Number two, commitment. Commitment refers to how dedicated the minority is to their position, often demonstrated through personal sacrifice. When people see someone willing to suffer for their cause, they're more likely to take that person seriously. Kaepernick risked and lost a multi-million dollar sports career. He received death threats and yet he kept going. Number three, flexibility. While consistency is vital, minorities also need to be flexible. If they appear too rigid or dogmatic, they're likely to be ignored. A persuasive minority strikes a balance, standing firm but open to dialogue. Kaepernick didn't force others to join him. He welcomed discussion, listened to others' views, and remained calm and respectful. This isn't something I'm gonna ask other people to put their necks out for what I'm doing. 
if they agree with me and feel strongly about it, then by all means, I hope they stand with me. According to Nemeth, this kind of open-minded approach is far more likely to influence the majority. So what happens when a consistent, committed, and flexible minority keeps pushing their viewpoint? At first, the effect is small, only a few people may be influenced, but over time, more and more people begin to pay attention. As the message spreads, it can reach what's called a tipping point, where the minority view gathers momentum and begins to be adopted by by the majority. This is known as the snowball effect, which describes how small actions or events can initiate a process where they grow increasingly larger and more significant over time. Alongside this is a phenomenon called social cryptoamnesia. This is when people remember that a change happened, but they forget how it started, or that it came from a once unpopular minority. Think about things like the right for women to vote, or widespread recycling habits. These were once minority positions that faced opposition, but today most people just accept them as the norm, and often don't remember the struggles or movements that led to those changes. Now let's bring this back to Colin Kaepernick and the Black Lives Matter movement. The changes they are trying to promote, challenging systemic racism and police brutality, are still very much ongoing. Unlike the suffragette movement or environmental campaigns, these issues haven't yet reached that tipping point. We're not at a stage where their minority view has become the widely accepted norm. We may be watching the snowball roll right now, in real time. So the question is, how long before people begin to accept these ideas without remembering where they came from? Let's now look at some of the psychological research into minority influence. Moscovici et al. in 1969 conducted a lab experiment to investigate how a consistent minority could influence a majority. Participants were shown 36 slides, all clearly different shades of blue, and asked to name the colour aloud. In each group, there were two confederates, working for the experimenter, and four real participants. In the consistent condition, the two confederates said the slides were green on all 36 trials. In the inconsistent condition, they said green on 24 slides and blue on 12. What they found was that in the consistent condition, around 8% of participants were influenced, and said green. But in the inconsistent condition, only 1% gave the same answer. Even though 8% might seem small, it's eight times more than when the minority was inconsistent. So what does this tell us? It tells us that consistency matters. And remember the snowball effect. The effect might start small, only a few people may be influenced, but over time, more and more people may begin to change their mind. However, while useful, there are some limitations to Moscovici's research. One limitation of Moscovici's study is that it lacks population validity. The sample used in the experiment consisted entirely of female university students. This means the findings may not generalise to other groups, such as males or people from different age ranges, cultures, or educational backgrounds. Therefore, the study may not accurately represent how minority influence operates in the wider population, reducing the external validity of the findings. Another limitation of Moscovici's study is that it lacks ecological validity. The task used in the study, identifying the colour of slides, is highly artificial and bears little resemblance to the emotionally and socially complex issues evolved in real-life minority influence, such as civil rights or political activism. Minority groups often face significant personal risk when challenging the majority. For example, Colin Kaepernick's protest against racial injustice led to death threats and the end of his NFL career, a level of sacrifice not reflected in a lab-based task to do with blue or green slides. Therefore, it could be argued that this undermines minority influence research because it may not accurately explain how minority influence operates in the real world. However, there is further evidence supporting the influence of minority groups, which comes from Wood et al. in 1994. In a meta-analysis of nearly 100 studies, they found that minority groups who were consistent in their views were significantly more influential than those who were inconsistent. 
consistent. This suggests that consistency is a key factor in successful minority influence, as it may signal confidence, commitment, and a clear alternative viewpoint. So what about research into any of the other minority influence factors? Well, Nemeth in 1986 explored the role of flexibility in minority influence in a more realistic context. In this study, participants in groups of four had to decide how much compensation to award a victim of a ski lift accident. One member was a confederate. There were two conditions. In one condition, the confederate stuck rigidly to a low amount. In the other, the confederate was flexible and offered a compromise. What they found was that when inflexible, the minority had little effect. But when flexible, they had much more influence, especially on participants who were undecided. Therefore, this supports the idea that flexibility is crucial in minority influence. So, from the Selma March in 1965 to Colin Kaepernick taking a knee in 2016, psychology helps us understand how minority voices, even when unpopular, can have an impact. Whether in a lab study or a football stadium, the same principles apply. Be consistent, be committed, and be flexible. That's the psychology of minority influence. For more psychology resources, don't forget to check out the Bear It In Mind website. I hope you found this video helpful, and we'll see you in the next one.